Hey, everybody. Welcome um, again to another webinar here. Um, this is our second Friday webinar with Elizabeth Roof, and I'm really excited to have her coming in, particularly today, because next week our district starts school, uh, district wide e learning. And um, <laughs> I know we've been doing this a little bit on our own for the last three weeks, but this is official. It is mandatory. And I don't know about all of you, but I might be freaking out just a little bit about having to implement a real school schedule. Um, so again, I'm thrilled to have Elizabeth joining us so that we can talk a little bit about that. Before we get into the heart of this webinar, I just wanted to point out that we have recorded a number of resources for all of you. In the past couple of weeks, we have um, a podcast and a blog so you can listen or read about mental health. Um, this is particularly important right now this is an incredibly stressful time for our loved ones. Um, their lives have been turned upside down just like ours, and they are at greater risk for mental illness. So take a look at that blog, download the handout, um, make sure that you know some of the signs and symptoms to be looking for so that you are ready to take action if need be. Um, also, Lauren Roth did a really wonderful podcast about caregiver stress. So if you're looking for ways to be the best caregiver you can be, um, lower some of your own personal anxiety, go check out her podcast. She gave seven um, actionable things that you can do to kind of help alleviate some of that stress and anxiety. And of course, last week we had a really great webinar with Elizabeth about behavior, specifically repetitive behaviors, uh, where she really gave some great, wonderful advice. Today's webinar is gonna be specific to learning at home, strategies that we can use as parents, not educators, parents, to help our kids. And I really encourage all of you to jump in on the conversation, use your control panel to submit questions, or if you're up for it, raise your hand using the, um, again, the control panel, I will unmute you. And I will let you um, ask your questions directly with Elizabeth. We really wanna have all of that interaction. So. Um, I'm the moderator today. I'm hoping that you won't have to hear too much from me. So I'm actually going to turn off my webcam so that we can focus on Elizabeth's presentation. And um, Elizabeth, if you could go ahead and take it away. Awesome. So happy Friday, everyone. Happy Good Friday for those of you who are doing that. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about teaching your child at home. I've actually uh, am a former teacher many years ago. I'm going to talk a little bit about kinds of things that work for people with PWS. And a lot of it really is focusing more on parents. So again, the, the pandemic that is going on, I will say, is not something anyone anticipated. It's not so, the, something that anyone wanted to do. Uh, and in case with PWS, you know, amazingly enough, they don't want you to be their teacher, right? Most parents are like, wow, it was hard enough dealing with them, you know, for a few hours after school. Now it's all day long. So I think it's important to kind of realize that nobody wanted this, expected this, and whatever else. And for all of you who work, it would be a little bit like if one day you were working and your boss said, hey, you're gonna hand your job over to Bob off the street, and he's gonna, you know, basically you're gonna give him some, you know, worksheets and whatever else, and he's gonna do your job. Definitely not a thing that anybody can do. I think it's really important to kind of know that it is not something that most parents want to do. So I've got just a few slides to show. And so I'll do that and then we'll open it up for questions. Okay. So I think to have some realistic expectations here, I tell people all the time, you are not a teacher. Your home is not a school, not set up that way. And you are not going to be able to be the teacher, the aide, the PT, the OT, the speech person, and the cafeteria lady all at once. It's unrealistic to expect anyone to be able to do all those jobs to do them well. You're not going to have the resources, the support, and the curriculum that you need because the curriculum that your school is giving you is one that they've developed for the school system with you know 20 to 30 learners in a classroom with a teacher who is well armed with all the resources and administrative supports that they need to be able to carry it out. Know that your kid is gonna find it uncomfortable with you being their teacher. I'm, for those of you who have been teaching, the most common thing is this, but that's not the way Mrs. Johnson does it. She didn't say that and she didn't tell us to do it that way. You're not doing it the right way. So just know that your kid is not gonna be comfortable with you being their teacher. As just, just as sure as you're not comfortable being their teacher. So just understand that you're gonna to have to find compromises that work for both of you. And it will take you a little bit of time, probably a couple of weeks, 
to kind of get into a rhythm of kind of what that looks like, what those compromises are. And again, the school can have all the expectations of how it will go, but they may not work at your house. They may not work with your kid, they may not work in your environment, and they may not work with you as a teacher. So I think it's really important to realize that school can tell you all day long how they want things to go at home, but that doesn't mean that's how it's gonna work. So you do have to kind of realize that some of the expectations may not be realistic. They may be very uh, unrealistic and they may be really setting a lot of families up to fail because again, they're asking you to kind of be everything you are at once. And for those of you who are also working at home as well as trying to educate your kid, you know, it was hard enough when you had the job that you have as parent and to be, you know, full-time or part-time employed to now add teaching on top of that, I think to me is a stressor for, for parents and for kids that we have to recognize. And so I tell people all the time, this is gonna be hard and probably the best way you can make it not be quite so hard is to have a sense of humor and to really kind of look at the ridiculousness of all of this. And again, if you were to do somebody else's job, you would understand how difficult it was that nobody expects you within a week or two to be up and running and doing that job great. And some people don't have the temperament to really teach their kids. So just kind of know your, your strengths and weaknesses. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. But it's this idea of, you know, know yourself, know what you're good at, know what you're not good at, and try to really lean heavy on those things that you are, are strengths for you. So ways to manage teaching at home. I think the, the most kind of first thing step you need to do is come up with a schedule that works for you and your child. If your uh, job expectation is that you're taking meetings and doing all sorts of other things, then you're gonna have to find ways to you know, teach your child at home while you're continuing to work. Uh, the, you know, Most kids with PWS, they're best in the mornings, man. They're up early, they're you know, excited, they're enthusiastic kind of most in the morning. So I think mornings are generally best. So if you can flip your work schedule so you're working more in the afternoon and, and really educating your kids when you can at, at the mornings, I think that's gonna be best. No one is going to be able to implement a eight to three, nine to four, whatever schedule your school is giving you, realize that is not gonna work in your house. So there's no way you're educating eight hours out of the day. You're doing laundry, you're cooking, you're managing all the other things. So just be aware that those aren't realistic expectations. If you can designate a school zone in your house if possible, I know that's not possible for everybody, but if you can have a, a table and chairs and everything like to kind of be your school, it really is a good way to kind of help your kid know that when they're in this environment at school and when they're in this other environment, it's home or whatever else may not be a possibility, but if you can find a way to maybe set up a place as your school, uh, like kind of like your schoolhouse, just so your kid can kind of know that that's where school is gonna happen. Make sure you collect all the materials and supplies that you need. Your kid's book bag should be hanging on the back of their chair in your schoolhouse. Uh, if you need construction paper, staplers, I know my kids are both studying at home as well. You know, you realize all the stuff that you have in your office, but you don't have here. So be aware that, you know, get all the materials you need. What you don't want is your kid to go look for a textbook or no, get to get something off the printer or whatever else and to be in another part of your house. Cause I can tell you as distractible as they are, it's gonna take you another 10 to 15 minutes to redirect them back to the task at hand. Uh, breaking activities into small chunks and taking breaks is really important. Most kids with PWS are not gonna be able to focus longer than 10 to 15 to 20 minutes kind of max for a task, unless it's something they really prefer and they really enjoy. So take breaks as needed, make things into small chunks. Do not look at long stretches of two to three hours for you know, a task because your kid is not gonna be able to manage that. Using hands-on activities to reinforce learning, you know, doing laundry to teach colors, to teach numbers, uh, cooking, planting, whatever it is, come up with hands-on activities to reinforce learning. There's lots of concepts that you can take and then you can take hands-on activities to kind of get your kid to get it. Most kids with PWS are so much better if their hands are engaged in an activity than just passively viewing. That is one of the problems I think about having uh, distance learning or online learning or whatever you wanna call it is that most kids have a hard time paying attention when they're watching a screen. It's not like they're watching a great movie that they love, it's a teacher you know, from abroad, like from a distance, or it's, you know, a 
video that they're having them watch and answer questions on. So it's not, it's going to be passive learning. The more hands on you can get, the more your kid is going to be able to understand the concepts, to remember them better, and to be able to kind of generalize them. Think about making uh, learning fun and engaging. It's not about just sitting there kind of like doing worksheets. Again, come up with ways of if I, if this is the concept that I'm doing, how can I come up with a fun way to teach it to my kid and how can it be engaging? Play-Doh, beads, art projects, it really kind of doesn't matter what it is. I think it's really important for your kid to be engaged. Know what their strengths are, kind of know, are they a person that likes writing? Are they a person that likes, uh, you know, doing math? Is reading their bag? Is it this? Is it that? Come up with things to that you can learn things in a way that really does make it fun and engaging for them. And at the same time, really encourage independence and self-help. Kids are stressed right now, so it's important for you you know, to not be the one who's answering every single question, doing every single thing, coming up with visual schedules so they understand what's coming next, how things are, are broken up is really important. And for them to be able to self-help. So maybe, you know, once they do a worksheet for a full of problems, maybe you give them the answers so that they can check their own work. Maybe they grade another kid's paper, a sibling or whatever. Come up with ways for them to actually be part of the solution and, and helping them be more independent because in this in this day and age it's really easy for them to be independent in school and to become much more dependent on you at home so you don't want to encourage that because what i'll tell you is is that this is going to go on for a while and you don't want your kid you know and i keep thinking so if we self uh if we have to learn at home for the rest of the school year which for some people that's exactly what it's going to be then you've got summer, oh man, they're home all the time already. And then you go back to school, you've got like six months of your kid really becoming dependent on you. So really think to yourself, what do I want to teach here? And a lot of it, I think it really is gonna be about encouraging independence where you can. Even if it's not great, it's better than you doing it for them. So again, kind of get past the perfectionist thing because that's not gonna really help you out here. It's more about them doing for themselves, even if they, you know, it doesn't look great all the time. I think one of the most important things for people to realize is that reteaching old skills can be just as important as gaining new skills. So if you can get worksheets or lessons uh, from the last three months, I wouldn't go back further than that, but anything from January on, you could pull out old worksheets, old lessons, you could rework them. So you take the same concept and you come up with new math problems or new questions that are kind of about the same passage they may have read or whatever else you can, um, do anything where they're actually kind of doing something they've already done before. If your kid has done that and then they kind of mastered that skill, then you can let them teach you or other siblings. So this idea is they can teach you a skill, a, you know, a thing that they learned, whatever else. Again, may not be perfect, but we find that the people who learn the most are the people who teach. So, you know, that old adage that if you can't do it, you teach. It's actually the opposite. People who teach know how to do things better than almost anyone else because they break things down into the steps that you need to know to do a thing, right? So I think it's really important here to let your kid be the teacher for a subject that they're good at, for siblings who are younger, anything where they can feel a sense of mastery because what you may find and they will find is that they'll find deficits in their, in their knowledge and they'll be like, oh, well, I don't know how to do this thing. Okay, so what do we need to know to, to teach that? Well, I need to know these things. So it helps them really think about how something is organized, how it works, and how they can do it to other do it for other people. You can take old skills and generalize them to new situations. Uh, again, measuring fractions. Uh, there's 50 different ways to get to things if you can come up with things that they know how to do and put them in new situations. It's just as much about keeping skills and learning new skills. For everyone who is in a grade, you know, the general uh, premise has always been educationally that every odd number grade is the, the year that you get the most skills learned. And even number grades are the ones where you're, it's mostly review. That's not exactly, teachers would argue, but, you know, first grade, third grade, fifth grade, uh, seventh grade, those are all where the most learning occurs. And then even grades like second grade and fourth grade are where there's much more kind of review, uh, generalizing skills, whatever else. So again, you really want your kid to keep skills. And for summer and everything else, it's really important about, you know, really keeping those skills because what we don't want is for there to be a loss of learning 
uh, new skill, uh, learning, relearning old skills at the, at the kind of cost of doing new skills. It's okay to say we're going to maintain versus attain. So this idea of, you know, we're going to maintain skills, we're going to practice skills, we're going to do a lot of rote learning, we're going to do things where your kid is already knows it, man. You don't want to bore them, but you want to kind of keep them on the same page where they're still kind of honing those skills, getting faster, getting better, getting easier, those kinds of things. Give them lots of praise and reinforcement. Uh, the one thing that teachers often do that parents don't is that teachers realize that by praising and coming with reinforcement schedules of iPad time or group time or whatever else, and if you've got one kid, it makes it a little harder, but are there things they enjoy doing? How can we use those to do less preferred activities first and more preferred activities second? If you actually have done a lot of the academic skills, you can even work on social skills. Uh, one thing that we're doing with some of our patients, and, and I'm sure we can find a way to get that info out, is Haley has been running these uh, kind of age-dependent Zoom groups with kids, not really young kids, they're not going to be able to get it, but kids, you know, who are like, you know, older elementary school, middle school, that kind of stuff, up through high school, and then kids older than 18 to actually have some Zoom uh, social groups, and, you know, you can do that, FaceTime with classmates that they know, that kind of stuff work on social skills you know we always say are they looking at uh are you looking at the person's eyes what are they saying what are they trying to say what do they want you to do what do you want them to do come up with ways to kind of take things apart because what you may find is that this can be a really great time to work on some of those social skills because if the teacher is going to be coming on the camera then we need to come up with ways to really focus on what she's saying what she means those kinds of things so it's a good time to work on social skills while you're at home because again, you have the ability to do it in a relatively small group. Some of you may just be, maybe you and your kid, but come up with ways to do those things. One thing I really will focus on is if you don't build downtime into your schedule, you're gonna get a lot of breakdown time. Uh, take time to exercise. You know, if we're, I live in the South, so, you know, we're already planning stuff or at least planning stuff in little uh, pots, things like that. Come up with that being part of your school day. So, you know, if, if some uh, schools have a uh, animal, a pet that they take care of, the hamster or whatever else, can we come up with ways to feed the dog, take the dog out for a walk, you know, come up with activities, educational activities related to said dog, like how much do they eat? Let's measure their food when they eat and whatever. What can you do to kind of make fun things or at least hands-on things part of your curriculum? Do projects around the house, you know, come up with ways, because again, you're gonna have to do these things anyway. What you don't wanna do is be a teacher and then every little bit of downtime that you would have where you could actually kind of catch your breath or do something that you wanna do, you're gonna end up doing laundry, cooking, cleaning, whatever else. Get your kids involved. If they can, let them do a thing that they're good at. Uh, use an afternoon for break from kids. <laughs> you need it, they need it. They don't have to nap, they can. Really doesn't matter, right? Everybody needs time. Have rules about when it's gonna happen and if they can interrupt you. I was just watching a Zoom or a Zoom uh, with somebody recently whose uh, child, the mom had told both of her kids that while she was on Zoom meetings, her kids were not to interrupt her unless someone was uh, really hurt or whatever else. And so the daughter puts a note on the mom's desk while she's doing a Zoom meeting that says, John is bleeding. Can we interrupt you? The mom's got like, ah, she goes in there. John's, you know, bumped his nose on the couch arm and it's fine. Get a get a paper towel and some ice. You'll be fine. Put your head back. And then she went back to her Zoom meeting. So this idea of what can they interrupt you for? What is an interruptible kind of thing and what's not? So I think it's important to come up with those rules about when they can, if they can, but generally they should have downtime that is away from you, in their room, in their school room, whatever you want to do. Afternoons can have a reading time, kind of a read anything you want. It can be kind of anything. It really doesn't matter. PE should be one of the things that you make part of your activity. And again, other activities that aren't academic. So since when your kid has had enough, when they're kind of at the end of their rope, their frustration level is high, it's too hard, they've done it for too long, and end things before they end them having an outburst. Because a lot of times the outburst is a way for your kid to take a break. And so if you take a break before they have an outburst, you've actually built in a break when you, before your kid has had too much. Read the behavioral cues. If they get agitated, if they're asking more, if there's something about them that lets you know that things are building, 
they're not going to be able to manage their attention much longer or their kind of you know frustration level much longer take a break before it happens and again keep things light move them on I obviously had a typo there move them off from getting stuck you don't want them to get stuck and when they start to get to the point where they're getting stuck you need to get them to take a break redirect do a new activity don't let them get stuck because then at that point you both are in the same position I think the most important thing is really focus on success and not failure. You're not going to be good at this all the time. And I still remember when I was a teacher, there were so many times where things that I had a great idea about and I had planned for and whatever would be a complete disaster. And I would just be like, wow, okay. Highlight the things that went well and why. Ask your kids, what do they like? What do they not like? What, you know, those kinds of things. And be grateful for the things that are going well. That's totally on you. At this point, you're doing everything right. So focus on that and be grateful for that. Start to list things that are strengths for you. So, you know, uh, I'm a person that's really great at doing things on the fly. I am organized, but I'm a person that, you know, when things don't go well, I'm pretty good at kind of ditching those and coming up with a new strategy. What are the things that are strategies for you and your child? Are they a person who likes doing the same thing over and over? Are they a person who likes to, always have something new what are the, and come up with those things and really start to be creative and come up with new ways to do old things you are not going to be your child's teacher like you're not going to be that person no matter who you are so come up with your strengths and and be creative about how to teach your child come up with concepts that they need to know how to do and you know if it's fractions why can't you do it with pieces of play-doh or come up with fun things because again most kids with pws can learn really well if you figure out the way that they learn best. Uh, if things don't go well, don't do them that way or don't do them at all. It is okay to basically say, okay, my kid sucks at this. I'm not good at this. You know, we can put, you know, this really difficult concept that the school is just harping on to the side and really focus on things that they're good at. Because once they start to master it and feel good about it, then often they become much more, uh, accepting of new harder challenges once they feel good about it but make sure that you self-care and to keep up the good work if you don't take care of you you're not going to be able to be mom co-worker teacher you know again all the things you have to be so make sure that you're taking breaks time for yourself doing things that you like it is okay if your kid at the end of the school year has not met all of the benchmarks that the school has laid out because i can tell you right now even at every school about half to or, or more than half don't reach all those benchmarks so don't beat yourself up really do focus on the success not the failure here my thought is is if you focus on that you will be a lot more uh happy about your performance than if you're if you're only focusing on the negative so if you're if you may have to write them down you may have to make a list whatever you want to do to come up with ways to really focus on the success there so i think those are the most important uh things for people to know and they're the kind of most basic but now what I'm gonna do is kind of open it up for questions and specifics or anything like that. So I'm going to take my slides off and Susan, I think we can go back to uh, your moderating and getting people to ask their questions and, and answer those. So again, um, we're gonna be taking questions in two ways. You can type out your question in the question um, box on your control panel or you can raise your hand. I will take you off mute and let you ask your question directly to Elizabeth. So however you're comfortable, um, that's those are the two, the two ways. Um, Elizabeth, let's start with um, a question that I'm seeing from a lot of people, including, um, and I'm feeling this, you know, I have this own issue in my own home, and that's around getting buy-in from the child. So Jaden knows that next week we're gonna have distance learning. Mm -hmm. He knows that it's required for everyone, but he's already resisting. It's that newness, the anxiety, yeah. right? Uh, I don't, I'm not going to do it. I am just, I'm not going to do it. I don't want to do it. Mm -hmm. So how do you, I recognize that, you know, we have to break them in a little bit into this sure. new routine, but how do we break past that initial barrier so that uh, they're ready to learn? So one thing that could be really great, and again, you have to kind of do it on a case by case basis, if you could get his teacher, and again, I know not every teacher is going to want to do this, but could his teacher or his current teacher or an aide basically be the one, we often do this with us, is that if somebody likes, you know, Haley versus me or whatever else, we do the handoff where we go, 
hey, it's Mrs. So-and-so, your fourth grade teacher. So I am so excited about the fact that your mom is going to be able to teach for me. I can't teach you directly and, and basically kind of go through the reasons. I mean, it doesn't have to be really specific, but your mom is going to do that. I have given her all the stuff that she needs to like, you, you basically build on confidence, competence, and kind of like the ability that the teacher feels so good about, you know, Susan Hedstrom teaching Jaden that she has like, you know, signed off officially on this, this transaction. And my thought is, is that may not do a lot, but it, at least the teacher has kind of officially handed the torch over to you for the time being so that you can do those things. And I would just tell Jaden, you know, I'm going to need your help, Jaden. I mean, you're, you know all the things about your teacher and your classroom and how they teach you. I'm going to I'm going to need you to really help me out here. And my thought is, is sometimes because they do like to be in charge of things or at least be bossy about things. It may be a way for them to kind of see it as, oh, this is an opportunity here, right? I can, you know, tell my mom what to do as my teacher. And my thought is you can start off like that. It may be a way to get them to buy in. And again, I think, you know, there needs to be some accountability factor. And I don't know what schools are doing because I think it varies. But I think schools need to find a way for kids who are struggling to um, engage or to buy in what they're doing to make sure that happens. Again, I think the official handoff. You know, if she doesn't want to do it personally, then a letter, like some way that she communicates, I, Mrs. Johnson, am giving Susan the ability to teach the kid kind of thing and, and make it official so it looks like, and she could even say, Jaden, you're such a great student. I know you're going to do great. Like, you know, really build up the confidence of the kid that this is going to be a situation that's going to work well. That may yeah. work. You may come up with benchmarks of some of some way, like so many hours, so many tasks. I don't know something where they kind of know that there is that we're sending this. We're sending our work to Mrs. Johnson. Are you really sending it? No, but he doesn't have to know that. So is there a way that you can have a backup that is bigger than you that he has some credibility with? Mm -hmm. Um, so Mandy Young has a really good suggestion to add on, I think, to some of the things that you were saying, which was. Um, she focused on what her daughter wanted to do first and focused on that for a week or so so that her daughter bought into it and said, oh, this is fun. I like this. That's a and great then idea. she slowly yeah. started adding in the newer, harder, less preferred tasks. Mandy, I think that's a great idea. It is. Um, so we're starting to get a few more questions. Um, could you give some more concrete tips for Zoom play dates? Uh, her typical child just gets on and blabs away with friends. But you know, this is hard for our typical kids with our, sorry, our kids with prader willi syndrome. Mm -hmm. How can we make Zoom calls um, more productive for them? Right, so uh, I know one thing that Haley's been doing, which I think is kind of cool, is uh, coming up with one or two questions, like a kind of a topic per se. So you could ask your kid before they get on Zoom. It should always be before they get on. They need some level of preparation. So what one thing do they want to share with their friend, right? So it's something that happened, something they saw, I don't know, anything. And then their job is to ask the friend, so since I saw you last, what fun thing do you want to share? Let that friend talk. So you're really working on the turn-taking kind of reciprocity thing. And so until that kid stops talking, you're, and we, we often do it with our, with our kid with PWS, until that kid stops talking, if you have to put your hand over your mouth to keep yourself from interjecting or interrupting, do whatever you need to do. So the idea is we want them to say a thing, listen to that thing, and then they should have at least one or two questions they ask, follow-up questions they should ask the kid. And you'll have to work on those things. It doesn't all happen at once, but it isn't a thing where I get on camera and I just start yakking, right? It should be a taking turns thing. And so we can get them to take turns, listen to what the person said and respond appropriately, then that's a real, that's a huge thing. So those would be the things I would start off with first. And then of course you can build on that. But I will say Zoom is hard for a lot of kids. When we did our Zoom uh, boss, uh, which FPWR funded, our boss social skills group, the thing what we found, it took almost two solid weeks of kind of these short Zoom sessions before we could get kids to stop interrupting, stop having their own agenda, of what, how, how they wanted the thing to go. And so my thought is you'll have to come up with some really concrete things. I think between five and 10 minutes is probably all you need to do. It shouldn't be 20 or 30 to begin with, and they can get longer. So again, you know, and you may have to sit next to your kid to kind of prompt them and help them initially until they come up with some skills. But I would say those are the things you can do. Uh, 
anyone who wants to can reach out to Haley. I know they, they don't have, we don't have the ability to take everybody, right? But uh, I do know she's running, I think there's at least three days a week, she's running at least two or three groups on those three days for different people. So I'm, I'm happy for people to reach out. But if your kid is very young and they struggle socially face-to-face, -face, Zoom is not, it's gonna be really hard for them. So just be aware. You're not taking a kid and going, hey, my kid, you know, ran a, a, a race, a, you know, 100 yard dash. I'm signing them up for the Olympics. Let's maybe focus on some of those kind of more basic skills. So, again, turn taking, uh, even like having a, I was telling somebody, a talking stick, a thing where they can only talk and they have the stick, right? So they have to hand it to you. You can work on the turn taking, the listening to other people making appropriate comments and it's okay to be really direct. They don't they don't get subtle. So when we'd have kids where somebody would say, hey, I, you know, they would say something and they go, how are you? And then the kid would go, how are you? And I'd go, does that make any sense? How are you? They just told you a story and then said, how are you? So your job would be to say, I'm doing great or I'm sad or I'm whatever. And then you say something appropriate back. So it's okay to kind of help them come up with some of those tools because what we find is, they don't learn from watching other people doing it. They only learn by kind of constant reinforcement and also redirection when they kind of run off the rails. They don't necessarily see it and do it, which is what most typical kids do. People with PWS don't. They need a real concrete reminder of the, the guardrails on either side of the road. I find as well that um, when we're trying to encourage Jaden to have conversations, whether it's on Zoom or on the phone, is kind of putting up some some parameters at the beginning, like we're gonna talk about this, giving them yeah. some topic starters so that they have that conversation. And, and then I find they can go from there, but yeah. he he can't just start on his own. He has no yeah. idea what to talk about. He has no idea, right. So you have to kind of start it for him. So having like one or two topics that they can talk about, and it's often about a pet or a preferred activity, but here's the deal. You don't want the whole conversation to be about what they want to talk about. I think the most important, I know Haley always says it, the most important part that people learn in, in the 10 weeks of boss uh, social skills group is there are other people and they have other thoughts and feelings that are not yours. It's like, who knew that it was that simple? Oh, other people have thoughts and feelings that aren't about me. I, you know, like we just have to kind of get them to realize there are other people involved. If you want to have a relationship, you have to listen to other people and you have to find something, no matter what it is, that is about them and not about you. And that sometimes took up to 10 weeks to get that skill ingrained. Right. Um, so we're starting to get a lot of a lot of various questions from a lot of different, different topics. So I'm just going to start peppering you with them. Okay. Um, I don't know if I'm going to be able to contain them to different, you know, to or group them to different topics. So yeah, I'm going to no, do my um, all right, so the next question is from Elizabeth. She's joining us from the UK. Um, you know, she says her daughter is really engaged with home learning. Things are going well, but she's concerned because her daughter wants to read books that are above her reading level. And she's worried that that's going to cause, you know, eventually frustration and um, might, might put her off a little bit from learning. So, you know, our kids love to take control of the situation. How can we, you know, allow them to still have that control, but perhaps guide them so that they're reading or to perform, you know, completing work that is truly at their 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 level. That's actually a great question, uh, and, and and it's a great problem to have, right? My kid wants to do more than they, you know, I and mean, I'm not sure they could do it. I still remember when my typical daughter in second grade brought home the Harry Potter uh, second like book. It was like you know, 700 pages, and she's like, "I'm going to read it." I'm like, mm, "Okay." So what we did exactly in that situation is, is we at bedtime would read 15 minutes and I would let her start. She could get some of the words, but obviously not all of them. And so we ended up do we only got maybe sometimes a page or two in that 15 minutes, but we would go through it. And after a couple of days of doing that, uh, it was pretty obvious to her, though she would never admit it, that she couldn't do it. So what we ended up doing is, is actually I asked, would ask her, do you want to read or do you want me to read? And I would read it out loud. You can come up with ways to do that. What you don't want to ever do is try to like dampen that enthusiasm because that's great that she wants to read things that are hard. But, you know, ask her if, you, if she can read it to you. Most kids with PWS have a harder time reading if they don't at least move their lips. But most of them talk out loud when they read to themselves, which uh, can she get the words? You may be impressed with how much she's able to get. And if she struggles with some, but she's still willing to do it. Wow, that just shows incredible persistence and, and stick to it. And so I would just, I would not want to dampen that. I would just see, 
how you can find a way to kind of, in a, in a fun way, interject yourself, read to me. And then if she needs help, help her. And then at some point, my daughter did, every night would ask me to read. We got through the entire book. It took months. Uh, it was a great thing for her. And she still at 20 still remembers that whole thing about how I never told her she couldn't do it. Kids remember stuff like that. Yep. All right, I've got a couple of hands raised. So I'm gonna try um, unmuting a couple of people. Jessica, Howard, you're gonna be the first to go. Let's, are you there? Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Great. Hi, everybody. Um, so my son is in eighth grade and we've already been e-learning for four weeks. Um, we pretty much hit the ground running since everybody in our district already has laptops. So our biggest challenge has been independence. Um, he really works well when I'm with him one-on-one. -on -one, we can kind of keep moving through. But if I need to leave the room to go work with his brothers or do other things, he just, just completely pauses what he's working on. Um, so I just need some tips for helping him focus on the task on his own without the one-on-one. -on -one. And I'm a little worried about what you said earlier about building back the <laughs> the need to have me one-on-one -on -one when he doesn't have that, you know, all the time at school. Right. Um, so that's my question. That's a great one, Jessica. And, and good to hear from you. I can't believe he's in eighth grade. It's like, what? So, uh, but that, so yes, I would actually say that's a great uh, segue into if you're going to leave, then you want to say that by the time I get back and you, and you and for a while, you have to kind of like literally get out of a stopwatch or your phone or whatever else, but basically say that, you know, he needs to have four more problems done or whatever else. And again, what you want to do is have some level of accountability built in there. So my thought is, is before you leave, you do the, oh my gosh, right. You really got this, man. You know this. So I think you can, how many problems do you think you could do before I get back in like 10 minutes? Let him come up with a number, go, oh, okay, can't wait, let's let's see it. And when you come back, it has to be, the, you know, if he's gotten two of them done out of four or whatever, whatever the, even if he doesn't meet the metric, but he's gotten some of them done, praise him, praise him, praise him. Oh my gosh, look at you. I had, look, I can't believe how much you've done. So focus on that and then start like stretching him a little bit. So more problems, you know, longer time, whatever else. Most kids with PWS want, and I've had many parents say that, they want them to sit, sit right next to them while they do their work. No. And if they have an aid, that makes it harder because they're used to that kind of dynamic. But I would just say, come up with some accountability factors, praise him, and uh, set up the expectation that you know he can do it, and then focus on any success. Even if it's a problem, even if it's half a problem, some show that he's done something while you were gone and then just keep stretching it but it is going to be hard because most kids with pws it's almost like you have to sit there and crack the whip constantly for them to be able to do stuff and it's mostly because they don't quite trust that they know how to do it and they do lack confidence so you have to really build up their confidence maybe a little obnoxious but build up their confidence so that they know they can do it and when they get any success any movement you praise them So our next question. Um, so for many of our loved ones, um, academics are not a preferred activity. <laughs> so we see behavior issues arise during these times of trying to accomplish learning. Mm -hmm. um, our next question is regarding consequences for behavior. Are they gonna work? Because it seems like um, that this mom is saying that they're running out of consequences before lunch. What okay. what can she what can she do that mm -hmm. will help extinguish some of this behavior and allow for learning? I mean, that's a great question. And it is, and it's again that behavior is communicating that the kid A doesn't want to do it, they that they don't, you know, and again, I get it. It's like, you know, everyone has something they don't like doing, whatever that might be. Uh, some of it is trying really hard to focus on the positive reinforcement along the way. And when it comes to negative consequences, it's not always about removing things. It can also be about not doing a preferred activity. So for most kids with PWS, they have something they like to do repetitively. And it's sometimes things that parents don't really see as reinforcing, but it kind of is. So iPad, TV, whatever. I would just say that for things that, that you know, things they want to do, you really do focus on learning a thing that they don't want to do and then doing a thing they do want to do. So 
your, your day is almost like a ladder, right? So the thing you don't want to do is the first rung. To get to the second rung, you got to do that thing. And you keep on going. So you try really hard not to use a ton of consequences, really to focus on more on positive things, reinforcement, uh, building your day. So you start out the day with easy things like that one mom said about, you know, the first week doing things you like. It's okay sometimes to do a thing you like to get your kid initially invested, but then you have to keep building up those rungs. And so I think talking about, you know, talking really uh, concretely about what those things are and coming up with the way so that you really are focused on the positive, whatever that might be, and really trying to, as much as you can, ignore the negative. I mean, you really kind of have to, and then redirect. If you need to change locations or person or activities, whatever you need to do, you want to do that, but what you don't want to always avoid something they don't want to do because then your kid will be like, aha, I only have to do this behavior and suddenly we're not doing math anymore. So you don't want to be that person, but it is hard. And I will say that, you know, if you're, if what you're doing is not working, come up with a different tact because like you said, and maybe even contact the school. What does the teacher do? How does she manage that? Maybe it's not a problem in school. So come up with maybe some more information, but I would say a lot of it is, is really trying to take something positive to put after the thing that they do that's negative. And I mean, and you will have, and some kids it'll just be hard because they don't love school. It's not a very reinforcing place for them. Right. Now I haven't had this experience with academic time yet, but my son also didn't want to go for walks. I simply <laughs> told him if we would go for the walk, we'd get home before screen time was supposed to begin, but he could have a few extra minutes. It would never be more than 10 or 15 extra minutes, but that was enough to get him motivated to get out and walk. So I'm hoping that yeah. by putting together a schedule um, with preferred activities coming after academic time, that that will engage him, crossing my fingers. Oh, that's exactly what you should do. And again, you, fig you figure it out. I tell people all the time, you do this all the time, you'll figure some of these things out. Don't feel like it's a cop out. People, you know, you got people always saying stuff. Well, you know, you shouldn't reinforce that negative behavior, and you you shouldn't give in to that. Well, I always say, you come live in my house for a week, and let's see how you feel at the end of the week. So I think it's really important to not let people, especially you know, relatives and other people, tell you what what you don't want to give into. If your kid is a crying, you know, weeping mess on the floor every day because of math, how much math are they learning then? Versus the idea that you take it and you put something fun after it. And again, learning 10 minutes that's intense and they're engaged is way better than an hour where you're just constantly having to redirect their attention back to the task at hand because they hate it. So come up with those things. And I do think, like you said, preferred activities are a great reinforcement, but you have to build them into your day like a ladder so that you get to the top of the day where you need to be. I'm gonna go back to raised hands. Um, Larissa, I'm gonna try unmuting you. Larissa has a kindergartner this year. I can. I also have a kindergartner. I can only imagine um, having my kindergartner with Prouder Willie at that time. Larissa, I've unmuted you, were you there? Yeah, hi, how are you? Good. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, so I actually have two questions. Um, the first one is, um, so I have a kindergartner and she um, obviously struggles with abstract learning like all of us or mm -hmm. like all of them. And um, I haven't actually told her that we're not going back. Um, and I just wanted to know if a, I obviously have to go back and listen to your webinar from last week about just anxiety because that's a whole new bag of tricks we're dealing with. Um, right. But um, I don't know if sharing it with her will, A, if it'll land, mm -hmm. and then it'll give us some sort of order as far as, okay, we need to continue our learning, mm -hmm. um, or if I should just let it go altogether, um, because she's never been, she's never completed a year at this school. Right. So it's not like, oh, remember how you were in first grade last year, and now you're in <laughs> second grade this year? Yeah. So, um, and she also hasn't really, like, been that they're she's very happy to be home because mm -hmm. it's so much slower there's less demands on her mm -hmm. um so i just wanted to know whether or not i should even broach that and then also um, my other question is um i'm putting together i'm debating doing like a sticker reward all of that which has obviously fallen on deaf ears in years past mm -hmm. but um i was just wondering if I did something a little bit more frequently, like um, 
I, I, I'm going to be creating a chart. I went ahead and got a laminator. I'm now a Pinterest mom with all this homeschool. <laughs> Good and, um, <laughs> and I'm going to be creating these charts where she has a visual schedule of her day. And I'm hoping mm -hmm. that it kind of gives her some, it removes the abstract from it all. Yeah. And then um, I'm thinking about making a chart that has like, like a done section where she can go and get those Velcroed images, whether they be something as simple as brushing her teeth or completing her worksheets or, you know, doing her teletherapy with her educational therapist or her speech or whoever and moving to the done section. And if she completes, but I, I'm, I'm a little torn on frequency. Mm -hmm. Like, if you get three, move three images of oh, Velcroed images over, do you get a sticker? How many stickers? How is it in the day you get it? And then I'm obviously going to have her buy in and she gets to choose like, is it a hike with dad? Is it a toy? Is it like all that? But I mean, you know, I don't know. So obviously it's a loaded question, but I didn't no, know. No, no, but that's a really good question about the reinforcement schedule. So generally the, the take has always been <clears throat> the younger the kid, and the, and the kind of earlier you're introducing, you basically increase the reinforcement schedule. So my thought is, is you want to do something that is actually more frequent, smaller, and then you can build on that. Does that make sense? So I tell people all the time, what often happens with reinforcement schedules is people put them so far out that the kids are like, man, I blew it at 9 a.m. I'm done for the day, you know? So you don't want to do that. You want to have that. And at kindergarten, she's a pretty young kid. Uh, so I would just say, that you sound like you have a great thing the visual schedules we did talk about in the anxiety and it does make people feel so much better about what's going to happen and whatever else and it's so much more concrete and most kindergartners even, even typical kindergartners they, they don't have any abstract well they got nothing so it's like i think it's important for you to know that this is her first like kindergarten is your first kind of you know experience into school the most important thing about kindergarten is you want it to be a positive experience. I mean, it kind of what they learn or whatever else doesn't really matter. Positive and cooperative. That to me is kindergarten in a nutshell, right? So if she is somewhat cooperative and is able to, you know, take turns and do do whatever, she's great. And if she's able to have it to be a positive experience. So I would just say do whatever you can. As far as the telling or not, I, you know, that's actually a a tricky question. I think for most kids, I would say it's important to tell them just so that they understand. But I get that when you're in kindergarten, it's like, what does that really mean? So uh, if it's a good experience, it may be a really great way to kind of say that, you know, your teacher has entrusted me to, you know, basically be your kindergarten teacher for the rest of the year because of, and again, I would really kind of minimize how, how big a deal the, the pandemic is, but just that this is what we're going to do to make sure that everybody's safe. And it sounds like you're doing a great job academically if she is enjoying the pace and everything else. That's what a lot of kids struggle with is things move too fast and too uh, they get too hard too quickly for them to feel good about it. So this may be a great way for you to make sure that next year when she starts school is that things have a really good foundation. So I would really just work on the most basic of things, making it a positive experience and doing whatever you need to do to kind of make that happen. But the sticker schedule, the visual schedule, the reinforcement schedule, make it frequent until she buys in and is doing well. And then you can start stretching her a little bit as you go so that you don't get to the point where like, oh, I don't really care if I earned a sticker. It doesn't matter to me. You don't want to get to that point. So it's just kind of a fine line. And you'll know it because she'll start checking out quicker when the reinforcement schedule is too much too soon. So just you sound like you have a really great plan enact it see what you get so uh we're all going to be implementing schedules of, of some sort here how do we avoid the schedule backfiring on us um we've got a question here her daughter um loves school but she's getting consumed by the schedule if they start something five minutes late her anxiety peaks so right. how could we avoid some of that yeah, that anxiety around the schedule. That that's a good one. Uh, you know, people with PWS like things to like run like a, a Swiss, you know, train schedule. So my thought is, I would just I would try not to focus so much on the time, is the order. So we'll do this subject and this activity, and then we'll do this. So I would focus less on the time. And I guess if they're older kids, it's a little harder to do. But for most kids, I would just say we're going to finish this thing before we move to the next thing, which people with PWS generally like. So visual schedules i don't think generally should have the time on there because it is so hard to make them happen when they're supposed to and again 
you're doing laundry and you're cooking lunch and whatever else it's like you're doing other things so i think it's important to kind of take the time out of it if you can and to also kind of let your kid know that you know i don't like being late i don't like when things don't run on the schedule it's okay to be uncomfortable it's not okay to have like a meltdown about it so kind of like focusing on you know uh those transition times so they know they're coming they know when they're going to look the next thing's going to start but don't focus so much on the time more on the order of things and see if that helps it may not you may have to kind of like work a little bit with that you also may find that the more she does it the more she's like okay well it's not the end of the world i mean i like it but it's not the end of the world all right, we've, we've had a couple people with hands raised. So Irina, I'm gonna unmute you if you're still there. Uh, Irina, are you there? Yep. Perfect. Hi, um, my question is, uh, the son is, um, when he already has a schedule to uh, like appointment with his favorite teacher and he's excited to see him and, but, before calling the teacher, he's like, I changed my mind. It was like, but we already organized the schedule. He knows and he actually asked the meeting and he's like crying and he doesn't want that meeting. What can I do in that situation? I mean, it sounds like he's anxious for some reason. I don't know. And, and anticipate anticipatory anxiety can look like that like right so i'm gonna ride a roller coaster i'm so excited to ride the rope and you get all the way through the line and then it's about to be you and you're like no no i'm not gonna ride it so i think part of it is to kind of manage some of the expectations so i wouldn't focus so much like i wouldn't I hate to say it i wouldn't give him a whole lot of heads up about the meeting because my thought is the more he thinks about it worries about it and makes probably some kind of catastrophic plan in his head the reality is, is that sometimes it's more important just to go, hey, J John, your teacher's on the line. Cool. Almost like it's a, an unplanned event so that what you can do is to be like, oh, excited about it, but not overly excited about it. So and if it's a disaster, just shut it down. I mean, there's no reason than having somebody who's crying and falling apart talking to the teacher. But you maybe want the teacher to find a way to communicate, be it emails like are there other ways that are less kind of like heightened anxiety and heightened uh anticipation versus you know being excited to talk to that teacher i think you have to just kind of know your kid well enough to kind of come up with a plan i mean we have the same exact challenge that you do whenever i ask Jaden if he wants to do something oh yeah i want to do that but i want to do it tomorrow he doesn't want to do it right then and there because again anxiety so, you know, Elizabeth, I've used your uh, recommendations quite a bit and I don't front load a whole lot. I only tell him things when he needs to. And we've also noticed when his anxiety is higher, we have more of those refusals. So when the anxiety is well managed, he he is more willing to participate in those activities. Yeah. Um, Marissa, I'm going to go ahead and unmute you so you can ask your question. You're unmuted. Marissa, are you there? Can you hear me now? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. Hi. So my son, um, Landon, he's 13 years old. Um, he's in seventh grade. He loves school. Um, he's big on time management, <laughs> of course, like they all are. Um, mm -hmm. What time is everything going to happen? Um, he is very obsessed with it. So I did create a schedule for him, um, and I did put down times. I did notice, or I did hear you say that times are not good. but um, he it's like if he doesn't see a time or when his next thing is coming up he gets very anxious but i've also noticed that he then stares at the clock <laughs> and it's a right. countdown thing. Uh -huh. everything's a countdown <laughs> and i don't know how to eliminate that because when we're doing um like aba therapy or anything like that he just he even while he's on there he's constantly staring okay. at the clock <laughs> so how do i how do i change that you know, with still having a schedule and not have him so obsessed. I almost took the clock down, <laughs> but well, then I thought, well, that might add more anxiety. So, right, um, right. so how do we address it? Yeah, that's a tough one. At 13, he's like, he sounds like he's at the age. And, it, and if you can meet that expectation, then it could be like, okay, right? So if you say things going to start at nine and it generally starts at nine, it's all good. It's when you can't. So I would say I would actually think about taking the clock down and basically say that you'll give them a countdown five minutes before the next scheduled activity thing is. 
And then at that point, like I would put up my iPhone, like on the, you know, like on a ledge, somewhere he can see it and see the countdown. You got five minutes to the next thing. And at that point, he may stare at it a lot, but he'll stare at it a lot less than if he, you know what I mean? Like than if it's there all the time. And so I would say, you know, you can continue to use the time, but maybe give yourself a wiggle room of like two minutes or th like something where, you you know, it, it, it may start at nine, it might start at nine or three or whatever else. And again, it's important because in the way that we're living right now, we can't always guarantee things are gonna start on time. It has sometimes nothing to do with us. Um, so I would do those things, but yeah, I would think taking it down and stare, because if he's staring at it, he's not learning anyway. He's not gonna like it, just be aware he's gonna hate this idea, it's gonna be awful. But you wanna come up with an idea for him not to actually be looking at the clock, because what he's focusing on is when the thing will start next, but not the thing I'm doing now. So. I think coming up with some way that there's a kind of like arbitrary five minute timer, you got, you can, you can even come up with what that is with him that he knows, but maybe not looking at the time the whole time. Does that make sense? So some way for it to be more global, 15 minute increment something, just so that he can know that you don't want to, if you stare at the clock the whole time, you're not learning anything anyway. Right. Um, well, we have just about hit the top of the hour. I can't believe that we've just blown through an hour. This may have been the fastest hour um, that I've experienced in the last three weeks. Time <laughs> is moving really slow out here right now. Um, I did, before we before we shut down today, I just wanted to mention um, again that we have another uh, webinar that we will um, we will post about next week. The next webinar is going to be um, Wednesday, April 15th, and we're going back to the topic of behavior. This is going to be with Patrice Carroll from Latham Centers. She's going to get on the line. She'll tell, talk a little bit about behavior, and then just like we did today and last week, we're going to open up for questions. So if you are struggling with behavior right now, we've got some resources um, or more resources coming your way. And Elizabeth, did you want to talk to us a little bit about some of the Zoom meetings that your team's mm -hmm. offering? Yeah, so we have Zoom now for kids. Like I said, I think it's under 18 and over 18. And uh, Haley Hunt Hawkins, who works for me, is on our Facebook page. So you can access it by that and sign up. We're also going to do some parent support group kinds of like times where people get like, we can kind of do like a Zoom. People say Zoom happy hours, like, can we drink? Uh, yeah. But this idea, this idea that we could get parents together. So she's working on coordinating that. So I think I'll do more of the kind of parents and whatever. She'll do some of the kid ones. And at some point we will be maxed out because there's only the two of us. But uh, we're, we're wanting to provide those so that parents can, can actually check in. So that will also be on our Facebook page. So it's the uh, Vanderbilt, I think, uh, PWS Facebook page. I think you can Google it. We have a post up there every day and other things. But the groups you can sign up for, it'll tell you the times when they're going to. And we're doing Facebook Live uh, parent support groups. We just did one on Wednesday. So we're going to do those as well. Just answer questions. Patrice is great. I'm so glad you got her and it's going to be a great uh, webinar next Friday. Well, thank you so much, Elizabeth, for joining us. It's always a pleasure. I really enjoy learning from you. Um, this webinar has been recorded, so we'll share it. We'll also share the slides. Elizabeth, mm -hmm. are you okay with that? I'm, I'm we'll right now. Perfect. Perfect. We will make the slides available as well. Have a great rest of your week. I hope that we'll see some of you again next week, Wednesday, April 15th, 9 a.m. Pacific time, 12 p.m. Eastern. Talk to you awesome. soon. Bye, guys.